How'd you get in the military? What year did you come in? Uh, I joined the Army in 1963. Oh, okay. Yep. Right I, before uh, Vietnam started getting... Well, I couldn't have found Vietnam on a, on a map <laughs> all the time. Um, <clears throat> I uh, played play football in high school. I made all league and all that. And I was going to try and go to a, a major university and, and play play ball. And I... I was good, but I wasn't that good, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I did go to uh, spring training, and I kept getting knocked in my ass. I got tired of getting knocked in my ass, so <laughs> uh, went back to Southern Cal, and I went to a junior college, and I, I played ball for them. And some friends of mine and I, we, you know, we discovered beer and girls, you know, <laughs> about the same time. He derails a lot of dreams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we joined the army with the intent of um, well, we there was five of us who joined. <clears throat> Excuse me, and um, you know I thought, well, we go in and, and uh, be uh, you know do our three years and get out, be mature men of twenty one, twenty two, and go back to school and get on with our lives, you know, the real world, and. Uh, Make a long story short, I uh, I found a home. You know, I uh, ended up well. I I, I enlisted for an airborne on the sign, mm. and in the infinite wisdom of the military, they sent me to radar repair school as an MOS producing school. And after thirty three weeks of radar repair school, thirty three weeks, yeah. <laughs> I said, hell with this airborne stuff. I'm going to be an electrical engineer and, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> I turned down the airborne assignment. I turned down jump school and uh, was sent to the 2nd Division at Fort Benning. <clears throat> Excuse me. To the maintenance battalion. And they had like two radar sets in the maintenance in, in the division and about – 20 highly skilled duty soldiers who were all radar repairmen. <laughs> so we're shoveling coal in the old barracks. And, of course. <clears throat> and I started soldiering and became friends with the, with the first sergeant, headquarters company, first sergeant. And um, yeah, I, I got orders for Korea and I went mm-hmm. to Korea to the 7th Division. And again, long story short, I became the operations sergeant of the 707th Maintenance Battalion. In Korea. In Korea. Yeah. And I celebrated my 21st birthday in Korea, and I made Sergeant E-5, and I acquired 11 FMOS. Oh. And I, I wrote, I was writing, tra- I, I got a lot of attaboys. I, was, I wrote a training schedule, f- you know, for mil- military subjects for the Maintenance Battalion. <laughs> you know, and these guys are all mechanics and whatever. <clears throat> Anyway, and and I, I and I maintained the SOI and SSI for the the unit, the battalion, and it was interesting. So I said, "Well, hell, I'm gonna go to OCS, be an officer. You know, this isn't too bad after all." Mm-hmm. Still thinking about getting out, so I reenlisted for six years. That would have been null and void once I got a commission, because mm. then you would have been a lifer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd have I, to drop paperwork to get out at that time, right? Well, well, it, 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 I, I'd have had a two-year active commitment and then reserve time. Got it. Well, <laughs> in my infinite wisdom, we had I think the six. Did you have a commission or were you enlisted? I was a sergeant major. I was enlisted. Ah, yeah, yeah. You know, Chris Zetz, hmm. seventh group sergeant major for a while. Anyway, no. So I, re- I re-enlisted, went to OCS, and at the end of our sixth week was the first social gathering with your TAC officers, and you sit down and drink some beer. and Well, and at 11 o'clock, bed check. 11 o'clock, I was downtown still partying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, did you get in trouble? Oh, yeah, yeah. I got, they, I got kicked out of OCS. <laughs> Well, that last long. They, they could have busted me, but they didn't, which oh, okay. is a good thing. So I maintained my, my E5 stripes. I went to the – I was sent to the 5th Mech in Fort Carson, who were building up for Vietnam at the time. 
And by, by now, this is about 1965. And I'm 86. And I was still like 22 years old or something. And I was the operations sergeant of the replacement detachment for a fifth mech. Hmm. Well, I came down on orders for an independent infantry unit in uh, Germany as 11F, as the op- O&I guy. Uh, so going, so I went to Germany and processing in through Frankfurt, uh, my, my records were flagged and I was approached to try out for an instructor at the 7th Army NCO Academy. Mm. It's sure. <laughs> I wasn't really sure what it was, but I said, yeah, I'll, try, I'll give that a shot. And the 7th Army NCO Academy is in Bad Tolts, where the 10th Special Forces Group was. So I went down to Bad Tolts. And I became a TAC NCO, and I qualified on a, on a leadership committee as an instructor. And, and uh, I was a sharp young soldier, you know, and tall and spit shine boots and all that stuff with my national defense and good conduct ribbon. <laughs> 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 and I met all these guys in, in special forces. I'm saying, hey, these guys are a different army, you know. I mean, I made some very good friends. And... Uh, I started skydiving there with the Trojan Sport Parachute Club. So I had a 11F MOS compatible SF. I was well, I was still a leg, basically, but I was a skydiver, and I had 40, 50 jumps when I did go to jump school. So I, uh, I, I, I bought this. Hey, you got to move across the street, man. Come on over here. This is where the you know, come over to the dark side here. <laughs> so I did. I put it. In my, I, I applied, and I was, they took me. And so one day I walked across the street and signed into the 10th group. And a duty officer, a guy named Mike Taylor at the time, and his name will come up a little bit later, um, signed me in, and I went to work in the S2 section, and then the, the group moved to Fort uh, Devens. Hmm. And I went with them with the advanced party and helped set up the S3 section there. And... Uh, um, I, I was running up, I, you know, I, I took that correspondence course and I was going up to the White Mountains with uh, some teams, you know, and I was trying to learn what I was supposed to be doing. And I uh, got involved with the Trojan Parachute Club there. I, had a, I, I was on a demonstration team. We were doing a lot of free fall demos. And um, I, I went down to jump school and did get airborne qualified yeah. finally yeah and uh but i was still felt a little inadequate oh and the 10th group awarded me my my uh, s qualification mm. you know so i've never really been a training group but uh mm. i was qualified you know so i could put a flash on my beret mm. <laughs> felt good and uh but i still have my national defense and a good contact for it, you know <laughs> Oh, my friends coming back from Vietnam with CIBs and Bronze Stars and stuff. Anyway, so I I, I, I kept pl- trying to go, and I finally did go. And I met some guys who said who were talking about um, well, it was that before CCN the SOG projects. Man, that's that's where it's happening. That's where all the action is, you know. Yeah, yeah sounds good. So I kept. Get volunteering, and and uh, they were pulling a lot of SF NCOs out and reassigning them to, to leg and 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 82nd, 101st regular infantry units. You know to bolster their spread the love a little bit. Well, the quality of their cad of their their NCO core, uh, which was dwindling. But uh, I, I, they kept me, I, which I'm very happy about. And I wasn't sure, and I did, I had acquired a top secret clearance by this time, um, but I wasn't sure really what they were doing at, in the SOG projects. Mm. <laughs> you know, so it's still pretty highly classified, uh, or it was then. So I go up to CCN, fly up there in a, you know, paint a black C-130, and this old rickety school bus with the windows shot out and bullet holes in it picked me and about three other guys up at the airport i've heard about this bus before <laughs> yeah. dick thompson told me about this bus. oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 
Same bus, I imagine. Same bus. <laughs> and went down to the CCN camp compound there, and uh, I found out what we we're going to be doing. <laughs> Holy mackerel! Wow. What I got myself into. I uh, I went down to one. Uh, well, I was assigned to a team, and I ran a mission with as, as wow. assistant team leader with a uh, sharp young lieutenant by the name of Travis Beck. And uh, we were up to the launch site at, at Quan Tree, and one of our indigs was, you know, rigging our pen flares. And the pen flare went off and it hit this poor guy right in the leg and ruined his career. He got out. And I took over the team, you know. Right then and there. Right then and there. And I had been down to one zero school. The SOG ran a one zero school that was a pretty good school. Yeah. Was this Oconus? Was this uh, in Vietnam or was this back in the no, States? No, no, it was in Vietnam. It was yeah. A camp uh, at a little town called Long Ton. Hmm. And Long Ton was a SOG training and housing facility. One of their one of their entities was running agents, you know, up north, and that's where they housed them and their trained. assets. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that is that school is the one zero school? called recon school as well or is this a completely separate thing well internal to sog yeah you may uh you may have be referring to recondo the recondo course yeah that was a uh, that was a course in the trang that was kind of uh just to give guys going in, uh, into sf assignments a basic concept it was nothing like the one well, i should say nothing like it was it was a very toned down version of the one zero school because yeah. this is training one zeros or SOG guys to be team leaders in SOG. Very different. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all forms of the weapons we had access to, a lot of firing, a lot of advanced medical stuff, learned IVs and, you know, some of the classified stuff that we're doing, we learned about. And uh, project, all, SOG was declassified in 94. Uh, so a lot of the uh, even so before then couldn't talk about it, but you know we so some of the dirty tricks we we pulled. <laughs> yeah, I was learning uh, about that at Fort Bragg or Fayetteville because I grew up in Fayetteville when Ranger Joe's was there, and I was reading Plaster's first series of books. Oh, did you? Yeah, Sog and Secret Commandos. Well, I'm in. I'm in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is. Which is, I mean, I grew up reading about you guys, like many guys in my age in peer group, and we were just enthralled with those stories because, you know, you got long range patrols, you got ranger units, but there was something very different about SOG and its significance, which is obviously the testament of time. I mean, it, historically, the most significant operational unit in Vietnam. Yeah, it was a uh, it it was rated probably one of the most I forget the right wording but uh, for the losses and in, in, in endured which were heavy very heavy heavy casualties yeah the uh, results were worth it almost yeah yeah we got some good Intel yeah I mean yeah dropping bombs on entire battalions of NVA and all the Intel that was saving troops lives in the country. <laughs> it was insane. So you, you go to how long was one zero school? Four. I, I, for, I forget. Four weeks. Oh, give or take a little bit. So it wasn't short. This is no, no, yeah. no. Okay. And culminated with an actual recon mission. Um, yeah, in, in, in a secure the, uh, long time is is down in the I core area or two core area actually is not far from uh, the big base of Benoit. And not far from Saigon, and you take back roads uh, down to Vung Tau, which is a still a beautiful coastal resort city. Yeah, a little bit safer, so you guys can isolate. It, it, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they've been doing that for so long that there wasn't any real uh, real activity. They, they, there were a lot of woodcutters, farmers out there, and you, you're a woodcutter now and then, and everyone would panic. But he's just a poor old. Vietnamese guy out chopping trees, you know. Yeah. Um, so you go to one zero school, you a dude shoots himself in the leg with a pen flare, 
that checks him out of a one IC position, and then you step up, and you now you're the the one zero. One zero. Hey guys, this podcast is brought to you by the U.S. Concealed Carry Association. You know we're big fans of survival, and survival always depends on one question: How prepared are you? Just like we work to be prepared to survive any situation, the USCCA trains you to be prepared and feel confident as a gun owner, especially if you ever need to use it in self-defense. I've been a member for over three years because not only do I get access to their online protector academy, where I can learn from experts on critical aspects of survival, such as how to shoot accurately under pressure and how to prepare for family and home defense planning, but I also get self-defense liability insurance in case I'm ever involved in a dangerous incident. There's a reason 800,000 American gun owners like myself trust them. So check them out at uscca.com forward slash FCS to claim your risk-free benefits right now as well as a free gift when you sign up. That's uscca.com forward slash FCS. Thanks, guys. Do you remember Do you remember very specifically your first operation and how that, how that felt? My first operation as a 1-0 um, was a unique one. It was in the DMZ. We, we had three DM targets. Hmm. All right, well, we mostly ran in Laos. Um, and, but we had, did have three DM targets. They, they, were good, they were good targets because there was a lot of activity coming right down through, through the trail. Uh, my, my first one, a guy named Ron Hanna, who uh, went on to run, run a lot of that nice sharp guy. He was he was with with me on that first mission when the guys got wounded in the leg with a pen flare. Um, but we were getting some real good intelligence, and we were in for five. Days. We, we planned a normal mission for five days, mm. and uh, ideally, it lasts five days. Sometimes you can stick it out a little longer. Too often you were shot out within hours or within a day or two. Um, and I'd done all of the above. But anyway, we were in for five days getting some good intel and we were on a side of a hill and uh, observing a lot of activity along the little trail and a little stream, <clears throat> excuse me, in the DMZ. And they were going to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the, the weather up there that time of the year, I mean, it always rains, you know. I mean, it always rains. And in the morning or, or late afternoon, the, the, the clouds roll in. And so you want to be real careful, you know, because you can't get out when it was, did happen to me later on. But uh, anyway... So they're going to flip flop teams because we we're getting good intel, but we, you know they want to burn us out, and uh, so we moved with you know you never follow trails of course, but we move on a trail covered by aircraft to an LZ. And they're going to extract us and put another team in at the same time. Well, by the time we got there, the weather had set in, and we kind of compromised our position by moving down this trail with an air, aircraft overhead following us. And uh, uh, long story short, we got stuck for another three days on the ground. Whoa. So we had a total of eight days on the ground. And in moving to the site, because I, I was a big guy, and I always carried a lot of water. I drank a lot of water. Yeah. How tall are you, sir? 6'4". Six, 6'4". Four. Six, four. Big boy. Yeah. Then and I ammo was, bearer. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, we expended all our all our water and, and rations. You know, so at the five day mark, because you expected to get we're ready to get out. out then you have about, zero food and zero. Uh, water. I'm thinking about cold beer. You know, by that time, <laughs> and we uh, out of water, out of food, but. In a lot of bamboo, you could tap bamboo, yeah, rolls and, and, and knuckles and joints, and get the water out of that. And, and you can do water out of that. Well, after we got out, that which is what we did. I mean, you can survive without any food, but you can't without water. You gotta have, you gotta have moisture. Yeah, I'm sure you learned that. And, but <laughs> so, <laughs> but we do have those, you know, purification pills. 
Yeah, so we were tapping the bamboo, and it's raining, but you, know, you can't really put up a collection thing in the middle of, you know, the DMZ. <laughs> yeah. Uh, about a week after we got back, Ronnie Hanna started getting these terrible stomach pains. And, uh, damn, so Max looked at him, they took him to the hospital, and they actually found a bamboo shoot starting to, starting to sprout in his intestine. Yeah. So he had a seed yeah. in his stomach and his guts, and it grew. It started to. <laughs> I mean, it didn't, you know, what a horror movie or anything, but it, it's uh Yeah, and they're one of the fastest growing plants. Oh, no, he was a lot of pain. So that's the synopsis of my first mission is one zero. Wow. That's <laughs> like eight days, no food, no water, you know. Wow. Let's yeah. talk about their first significant contact. Um, throughout all my experiences in war, there's there's a lot of them, but the ones that stand out are like the first one, the where the one where you almost didn't make it out, and potentially the last one. Let's talk about the first major contact that you're in. Did did you did you sense? Because I, I always ask the Mac V saw guys this because you always hear about what it's going to be like, and there's this fantasy that young men, when they want to serve, when they want to fight, want to get into the mix, and then there's a reality of when things hit the fan. You went through that. We uh, there were a few guys. I won't mention any names. I'm sure you've heard of them. Uh, famous in this. Annals of Sog. I, I I was a pretty good. I, I got a lot of accolades as a one zero, mm. and I got you know the Silver Pistol Award, which I didn't expect at all uh, for being a good one zero, mm. whose main mission is gathering intelligence, mm. not getting into contact, not getting into contact. <laughs> yeah. So I was pretty good hiding and sneaking and getting out when I had to. Yeah. My my first my first contact, which I got a Arcom with V for. Not to talk about awards and stuff, but yeah, and that's for you guys listening. That's Army Commendation with Valor device, and there's levels of V, v devices as far as the the order of the hierarchy of the the contact. But that's an award for Valor, just so you guys know. Yeah. Uh, the the Arcom is a the least. I mean, it's still, I was very proud of it, you yeah. know, but it's, it's, it's a recognition though. Yeah. yeah. Recognition. It was for a, um, for a bright light mission. And I was, I, I had my team, I, I'd run a, a few missions since or before this. And I was at the launch site, um, uh, and my AO was, was socked in and they couldn't get me in. So we're just hanging out at the launch site. And a friend of mine who you may, he just, Finished a book. He had very big agency guy by the name of Dutch Waranga. Mm-hmm. Had a team. His team was Cambodian. He had a Cambodian team, and a guy you may know named uh, Steve Hoffman, mm. which is one one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Steve went on to be the head of Homeland Security in yep. Pe- uh, Pennsylvania. Is it? Mm-hmm. Like? Yeah. So like probably know him from the unit. Yep. Um. Steve was his one one. He got shot in the arm. <laughs> Excuse me, got wounded. Uh, Dutch the Dutch team was split. He, 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 he was in, on an operation. Got made contact, uh, and they're going to put a bright light team in. And I'm hanging around the launch site and say, you know, if you want to go along? Yeah, I go along. So I got into Chase Bird as a, as, as a, a, another Chase medic. Oh, I'm not a medic, but you know, I can put a band aid on as good as anybody. So I went in as a chase medic, just getting some air time, you know. And I'd be damned if they didn't land and we offload and we're on the ground. And uh, we get Dutch out and uh, there were some guys coming over the hill. So we had a little contact. There was no major, no major blow up, but that was my first actual engagement, engagement uh, with, with the enemy. Yeah. Over and above any recon or intel gathering <laughs> missions. Yeah, and and recon, a lot of people don't understand the, the like you see the sniper and reconnaissance stuff, and I was in reconnaissance my whole career, and I would tell my guys like if the job is boring, then you're doing everything right. 
because intelligence and information and relaying that to people is the most significant uh, part of it. And when you're making contact, you probably did something wrong potentially. I used to, I, I, and I told people this when I was training later on that, uh, you know, an ideal mission is one where you go in, gather intelligence, you get out without a shot being fired. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Some guys don't like that, though. I know some Mac saw guys here. <laughs> they like to poke the bear. They, yeah. Yeah. They, they like to go hunting. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the pinnacle moments of your career. I, I recognize a couple of moments in my career probably two or three very specific moments where I I remember thinking in my head, this is not going to work out. Like I might, I might be on the, the back end of survival and, and I, whether it was overwhelming firepower or just the, the circumstance, I felt pressure. Did you ever have those type of situations and, and SOG in your experience where you felt the pressure and potentially you're like, Oh, this, this is what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> let, me, let me regress a little bit uh, on the second major or the second bright light mission I ran bright light missions are when you go in to support another team that's been mm. shot up and needs help it's needs like the QRF they're like yeah, quick reaction force a for, quick re yeah, yeah if you will <clears throat> so you always kid up a lot of lot of bullets, you know. You don't take a lot of. You don't plan on staying in very long. Mm -hmm. Just a few hours, maybe at the most, a day or two at the very most. Um, but <clears throat> we had a, a a a guy went in the country with me at the same time by the name of uh, Bob Coleman, and he was running with the one zero by the name of Al Masiello, and Al was a. Uh, you know, we were all in our mid twenties thereabouts, and Al was in his mid late thirties. Mm. He's from uh, Rhode Island, and they say he family was connected with, the, you know, the mafia in some way or another. Italian, <laughs> and he kind of acted like it. You know, he liked yeah. that persona. But anyway, <clears throat> team, his, his team got all shot up, and the uh, team was split. Uh, he got out. Uh, Bob Coleman, who was became a friend, um, was missing. Then they got a, he came up on a survival radio. Mm. Uh, we, we carry, you know, you come up on, on beeper and, uh, and they got his, they had his beeper and, um, knew he was hurt. And I was at the law site and I took my team in to find him. So, so that beep is an SOS that he's potentially hurt. Cause he's not saying this on voice. Well, you, you can. I mean, the, the, these radios, uh, they're, uh, I'll, I'll try frequency radios, uh, they're International Guard frequency. I yeah. Guess. I forget what it is now, but it, when you hit it, yeah. it transmits it a beep. That. Yeah. You can come up on voice. Yeah. On the same frequency. So you're landing knowing it's probably worst case and you're just going to a grid, a grid site? This is very hilly, very rugged terrain he was in. And we had a approximate coordinate of where he was. Wow. <clears throat> um, you know, use one over. We we didn't have GPS. Yeah. Um, one over fifty thousand map. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, we found him, and Bob was hit four times. It was AK rounds. One in the leg, one in the shoulder, his hand, and. Drilled dead center. Gut shot. Just below his chest. It wasn't a sucking chest wound. But yeah. he had a hole right right there. And he was conscious. He had uh, given himself morphine. I started an IV. You know, <clears throat> I started to put it in his right arm. And he said, um, Cliff said, I appreciate you know, put that in the other arm. He said, well, I didn't want to say his hand, his hand was half blown off. Oh, but he knew it. He said, oh, I guess it would leak all out my wrist, you know. So he, he he knew he was in bad shape. Yeah. I brought in a real medic, a chase, not a chase medic that we did have up flying overhead. Land and brought him in. My one one a guy named Roger Teeter was a big guy. 
and I took point and we started moving. I was chopping foliage and trying to clear a way to get up to a landing zone where we were coming in to get him. And he was alive when he put him on a helicopter. Mm. As we were going up, we, we, we made contact. We were assaulted. And so we had to, one, move him and, you know, defend ourselves on the way. And uh, that was a pretty close, uh, pretty close call, if you will. So you're trying to uh, do that. Does the helicopter with him get off and then you make contact or is it contact? On the way. On the way. Wow. How many, how many people were carrying the, um, him as you guys were extracting? How many did it take to carry well, but Roger picked it up by himself. He just like had him over the fireman's carry. Oh wow! And uh, and, and we, I can say we, we brought a, a, another a chase man again who who did more, started a better IV and, and patches patches here and there. And um, anyway, so we got out. I got back to the launch site, and we found out that Bob had it bled out in an evac hospital. Oh. Yeah, that, that that sent her around and took her spleen out, oh. and uh, he bled out, and that, that that bothered me for a while. Still bothers me a little bit, you know. Yeah, but that that was my second major major conflict. Well, it should it should bother you. I mean, losing guys is hard. Yeah, especially when yeah you know, I've, <laughs> I've seen it before where you know one of the guys Ben Bittner, who my son's named after, uh, was a teammate of mine for several rotations and. He got killed. He was a team sergeant in third group in Afghanistan. Stepped on a pressure plate IED, kind of leading the way for his guys. Uh, he was a really competent 18 Charlie, so he knew demo and he knew IEDs. And he stepped on it, and it blew his leg off, but he was still alive. They got tourniquets on him, and he wanted up passing away in the helicopter. Uh. But the hope you got when you load up a guy and you're like, there's a chance, there's a fighting chance – and to find out they expire at some latter point is 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 one of the worst feelings because it almost feels like it's helpless. Like um, you wish you could have did something, but I, yeah. I think at that point it's out of your hands. Well, you you gotta uh, you you choose your line of work sometimes. And yeah, that's one of the downsides of it. Yeah, Ben Ben always told me if I die in this job, I died doing what I love, <laughs> and so I. There's there wasn't much mourning for him or or subsequent teammates because they had a choice and they, they wanted to be there. Um, how many how many years did you wind up doing in Vietnam and do you remember how many rotations and how many uh, combat missions that you went on? Uh, I I do not. I probably ran. I. There, there, there are a lot of stories. Guys talk about going and coming and then running. You know, I had one full year and then I extended, and I was on. I, I think it was on my second extension when uh, I decided to hang it up. Mm. You know, so I would say I was active in the recon business for a year and a half. Mm. In that time, maybe. 12 ish mm. recon missions because you'd run a mission and then you little stand down then you train up you know yeah um so if you can average like two a month is pretty good pretty good uh, uh plan mm. because uh, just to go just keep going and coming going and coming you, you know you, you're gonna die that way and and you got to plan these things. That's one reason why I was pretty successful because I would plan plan these missions. You're more deliberate with it than just hastily, yeah, running into it. Now, when I was wounded, I was actually assigned to the first group in Okinawa, hmm. and I'd made seven by then, and uh, I and I was an intel sergeant on an A team, and I as my I made the big time. Mm. You know, I was on an A team, mm. and I was fast tracking to 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 take a team, mm. which which is the ultimate goal. And uh, yeah, especially for to be be a team sergeant. That's you know? right. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, and I, I so I was I was uh, kind of heading that way, and 
We did all kind of things in the first group. You were in the first group? Yeah. Oh, it's 10th group and third group. Yeah. And 19th group, the reserve component. Yeah. 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 First, the first group was always an active. I mean, that was where that was everybody had a different mindset in the first group. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you're always doing something. Hmm. Always doing something. And Okinawa is a long way from Fort Bragg, so you're a long way from the flagpole. <laughs> yeah. It's true. I've heard a lot of stories from guys who were in C11, and you know whether the the company or the SIF and and first battalion in Okinawa. And there's always, I mean, the stuff they did in the Philippines when the rest of the the groups weren't doing anything is substantial. Well, we uh, I, I went to scuba school in Okinawa mm. with Don Simmons mm. and Bob Little. You may know yeah, those. I know. Yeah, yeah. And but Don Simmons is the hardest man I ever knew. He's the toughest dude I've ever run across in my, yeah. my entire life. Yeah. Did you? <laughs> so you did your SOG rotation in your time, and then you ripped back into, and then rotated to first group into Okinawa. Um, that's what I was trying to do. But you know, I, I ran that Halo mission, and then uh, that was my. My, my last, well, I was my last mission, uh, another bright light mission, but after that, I was done. Let's talk about the Halo mission before we before we move on. T tell people what that means, and then and then let's talk about that actual operation. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I was never really Halo qualified per se. Mm -hmm. I was a skydiver, but I had trained with the the. The tenth group, Frank Norbury, the tenth group Halo team. Yeah, I made a lot of jumps with them. I made equipment jumps, a couple of pretty high ones. Um, <laughs> and a Delta Project had had closed down, and those guys were either leaving or coming up. And uh, if you were with Sammy Hernandez, mm -hmm. I've heard the name. Or, yeah. yeah. Well, Sammy came up to CCN, and uh, I took him out on his first mission up at CCN, you know, and Sammy was an E7, I was an E6, but that didn't. And we took Lieutenant Wonderlick, Lightning Wonderlick, mm -hmm. and uh, we, it's kind of an interesting story. We, we, we had a, a mission to ideally get a prisoner, and the area we were in had a lot of karst lava rock formations. Some of them were 100 feet high. Mm. Looked like st stalactites sticking out of the ground in mm. this valley area. And we went in. I can't remember if we went in on ladders or rappelled, but we, we, we didn't land. There's always land on top of one of these. Mm. And my plan was to sit up there. And the trail was right there. My plan was to sit up there for a couple of days and observe and let things quiet down and then, then sneak down and set up an ambush along the trail so to see what we could get. Mm. Well, we were surrounded in about five minutes after <laughs> the helicopter left. Wow. Yeah. And uh, Lieutenant Wonderlick, Fred, who became good friends, I was caught into taking him out. He was the, 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 the camp veteran control officer, the club officer, and, you know, Sergeant Major Hobbs said, Newman, why don't you take Lieutenant Wonderlick on an operation? I said, oh, hell no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so your friend came down and said, I mean, you're the one zero, uh, no problem with the rank. And so I took him out. <clears throat> I said, Fred, you have your CIB yet? Is now, see those bushes moving down there? Put a couple of rounds down there, and he did. And they fired back and says, got your CIB on this one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So we're sitting up there about the second night in, and we hear this tractor, a, a, a motor. And I'll be damned, here comes a little road crew filling holes in the Ho Chi Minh Trail, you know. And it's probably an old Russian hill, a bulldozer of some kind, and the guy in front with the lantern, and the guy in back, and they're yakking. And, <laughs> we can look at this. So we watch them and you know ascertain where they went off. And next day, I, I called in an airstrike and we got him. We got the got a major 
road crew dump, you know. <laughs> road repair crew. Yeah. Felt bad about looking. They probably weren't hardcore NVA, but. Yeah. Facilitating they, they're, the know. trail. Yeah. So anyway, that, that's the story. So Sammy and I became good friends. And we were thinking about what else we are going to do. We were kind of wandering around uh, the camp without any real aim in life. And Billy Waugh comes up. Hey, you two, uh, we're going to put together a Halo mission, and you guys are on it. Billy just came up and just said you guys are doing so many doing words. Halo. <laughs> I said, uh, Billy, I said, I'm a... I was a skydiver, man. I ain't no Halo guy. He says, you're a one zero. You got a lot of experience. You're on it. Wow. So that's why I got involved in the Halo mission. <laughs> you weren't even Halo qualified, but no. you were. And that makes sense. I mean, the agency has free fall stuff. It's like you could jump. You're a jumper. And now, like when I went to free fall school, um, in years prior, they were allowing this. You could test. You could test the school out, like you could yeah, uh, yeah. challenge the school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, then you know, you just do the check the block things, combat equipment, O two, wall locker jump, and then get your rotations out, and then you're Halo qualified. Well, we uh, saw. Did, I mean, there was not a lot of oversight. Yeah, I mean, we Which had is one a of lot reasons. of all time. Yeah, yeah. As a one zero, as a staff sergeant one zero, you could do anything. I could, you know. If I was on the ground, I was general, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you had to use that accordingly, you know. You could, you had to use that authority appropriately. Yeah. But anyway, so we got talking, put this thing together, and uh, we took. <clears throat> they brought some guys up from CCS, um, a couple of riggers. And some mountain yards that were uh, pretty good guys. And we had Sammy, myself, and Billy Wall was involved, going to be involved. And um, so we started training, and uh, we were making some jumps in and around. We went down to Long Ton and uh, did some jumping out in Warzone, Warzone D and um, we we narrowed it down to uh, to a team. We had it was uh, um, Sammy, myself, and Melvin Melvin Hill, who was the actual one zero, the team leader. He was a, the ranking guy. Mm. It was you know it was kind of an odd. He he's black. Sammy's a, a Tex Mex, and I'm white guy. <laughs> I'm talking white guy. <laughs> We had two Rod A mountain yards and a Vietnamese guy. That were free fall qualified? We, we trained him. Oh, wow. Yeah. So three, three in So there were six. Yeah, three and three. Wow. Okay. And uh, we trained him. I mean, these, these mountain yards, I mean, there, there's no word in their language for, for parachute, especially free fall parachuting. Yeah. But we, we trained him, took him to 12, and we had CAP-3 timers, uh, checkmate timers are a lot lot better than the, the F-4Bs, big bulky things that the Army was using. <coughs> of course, timers are very sophisticated nowadays, but uh, the CAP-3 timer was smaller and it was re rechargeable. You could get 20, 30 jumps out of the thing. And I remember watching these guys, we, we started doing – doing uh, equipment jumps, these mountain art, you know, they're all little short guys, you know, they're mm. small. And watching them walk up the ramp of a 130, you could see bunny helmet, backpack, and rucksack, and it looked like penguins, you know, walking up. I used to think, well, look at that. <laughs> were they front mount the rucks, or did you, you guys were doing rear mounted rucks? Did, well, they, they were, they're, they're, they're called in dig rucks. They, they, you know, who was Smaller it? frame. Yeah, yeah, small. Um, not rigid. Mm. And we had car 15s. Our weapons, of course, were smaller. And we kind of jury, we jury rigged everything. We, we, had, we had our uh, T-10 canopies modified into a seven gore TU configurations. Wow. You know, put control handles on them. And, so and they're a little like more considerable, but not much. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so that's we had the team going. We had a target, and 
And um, we had two launches scrubbed. One, the weather was just so bad that the uh, pilots said, we're not even going to fly. The other one, it was scrubbed because they intercepted a message from Saigon to Hanoi with our names and coordinates of our drop zone. Wow. The, had that message not been intercepted, we wouldn't be talking here today. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So we finally made a third one. Uh, we got 17,000 feet. And uh, our control launch site actually was at NKP Thailand, not Confidam Thailand. Um, and Mike Taylor, who was a, then a captain, was the guy that signed me in the 10th group earlier when I first reported in the Special Forces. Well, he was a launch officer over at NKP and uh, didn't know it at the time. And he says, he told him that, uh, well, we made a jump. I was the first guy off the ramp. We were at 17,000 feet. <laughs> we didn't have bailout bottles. Yeah. And we didn't pre-breathe anything. You know? So at 17 grand, you guys jumped with no O2? <laughs> we had a console. Yeah. and we're Passing it around? Well, what we had hoses from the console. Yeah. But nothing to plug them into. So we're just <laughs> sucking on, on the hoses, you know? I mean, the adrenaline, adrenaline's pumping, so you wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't matter anyway. How dark was it when the, that ramp went down? I mean, well, you, you couldn't been... see it. Well, one, it was two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And two, it was pouring rain. I went to a rainstorm about five seconds off the ramp. <laughs> so at 17 grand, you guys get out and you guys fall, you're going, falling through a rainstorm. Free, in free fall. Yeah. Do you guys use chem lights to track each no, other or nothing? No. Complete pitch black. No nods, obviously. Well, we, 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 I had marking panels. Yeah. That are fluorescent, you know, like, like lay out a DZ with a yeah. marking panel under my bungee cords that works great in the start at night, but didn't work at all in <laughs> rainstorm. <laughs> and two, my, my, the altimeter kept flopping up on my chest, so I'm falling, and it feels like icicles. If you jump through a rainstorm, it feels like icicles hit you. I'm trying to stay stable. We do have little lights on our altimeters. And you guys are running like a, a panel? Chest-mounted. A chest-mounted panel. with uh, you guys were, were you guys using boat compasses or just altimeters? Yeah, just altimeters. So nothing on the wrist? No. Okay. No. I mean, it's a ripcord handle pull, or is it a still a? No, no, there's a ripcord, uh, 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 standard, not ripcord. a blast handle, but but actual ripcord. Actual ripcord, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we had timer. We didn't have timers on us. We had timers on the indig, but we didn't have any timers on us. Anyway, we're on the ground. Well, I landed. <clears throat> And uh, I f finally said, you know, I'm out of here. And I, I, I f pulled, turned out, I was right around 2,000 feet. So I was at a decent altitude. Yeah. And I, as I was coming out of the clouds, I could see mountain top, hilltops, you know. Landed in a wide, not valley terrain, but it was uh, thinly uh, veg thin vegetation it wasn't a jungle per se but uh, how was your landing did you get to, were you able to see the ground enough to get a flare in or did you just eat eat it I just put feet knees and heels together and yeah. got ready to bust my ass which which I did you know because we didn't drop the rucksacks we, we kept the kept rucksacks them, yeah. mainly because they were you know in case you hit a tree I mean they are it is yeah, some protection pad, yeah. yeah and my canopy was draped over a fairly short tree and I wait for the wind to rustle and I'd pull it and and then uh, I also was carrying a uh, homing device that we scrounged scrounged from the agency that was uh, about so big put up a uh, antenna and it uh, emitted a signal that the team had little AM radios and they can all vector and in you get to know 
and you get a beep here, a null here, that's the direction you're going. Of course, you had to have 180 awareness because you could go the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that wasn't decided to work in a, those things weren't intended to work in the rain. And I was, it was like like a couple of inches of water on the ground when, because of you know, rain in that, that time of the year. Talked to Mike Taylor later on, as he told him that they had no business putting that team in, and he was told that they would launch. Why? What, what do you think that was? Politics. Was it politics, yeah. Because they wanted to make it happen. They wanted to make it happen. They wanted to be uh, a part of the brief when they say they infiltrated Mac V. Sog into yep. behind enemy lines. Well, we uh, so I got situated, got my stuff together, ways to the first light started to come and I started moving toward higher ground and there's nobody around me. And I ran into one of the mountain yards by, by, by quarter of fate, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Cause I heard movement and sure enough, it was one of our guys. He and I were together. Uh, the other mountain yard and the Vietnamese guy were together. Sammy was by himself and Mel Hill was by himself. So we had like four individual entities out there. <laughs> and we were there six days. And we uh, we moved around a little bit and then we you know, there was some movement firing off in the distance, but we you know, we did, nobody knew we were there, so Yeah. And about and I and I was encoding our the coordinates. I I was taking azimuth, back azimuth off of Mountain tops and and I had cut my my map down. You know, we we had a six grid square to work in, mm. and I'd cut my map down to six eight eight clicks. Put acetate on it, and I'm working off of that, and you know, it looked good to me. Yeah, <laughs> you just the compass in a in the map, and. Uh, so about the third day, Mike Taylor was flying Covey, and the pilot was a guy by the name of Jim Latham. Hmm. And uh, that's, that was Jim's first assignment. <laughs> and they found a hole, and they came down through the hole, got under the clouds, and I had a shiny, and, and, and they, so they got an actual fix on my position. And I was doing all the communicating with them. Mel was so scared he didn't talk to anybody by himself. He was yeah. by himself. <laughs> so there was no link up, no, until the very end, I no. imagine. So they got a fix, and then they he said, oh, "You better be sitting down." And they set the coordinates down, and I was like ten clicks from where I was supposed to have been. Oh, and we found out that. And we we never later on the crew that dropped us came back to drop uh, one of our training missions. We still have a school in Long Tom. We put about five or six teams, maybe seven or eight teams, some Vietnamese teams that never got off the ground. But there were five total uh, air, uh, Halo inserts in the SOC project. Anyway. Um, where was I going with that? So the link up, you guys are uh, trying to link up to get X filled. Well, they they, were, they they finally came in with a Jolly Green and picked us up and uh, took us into an air Udorn to an air base in Thailand, and then the Blackbird flew us into Saigon, and they turned it a success because we got out. Yeah. They didn't lose us. <laughs> they didn't lose you. Yeah, so they, they, therefore they call it a success. Do, so when you guys, so being in four separate groups, everybody vectored in on the Jolly Green that came in, and that's when you first saw the guys, or did you guys rendezvous before that? No, by the time, by the time, when, when well, when Covey got down under the clouds, everyone, you know, the other entities could sense that something was happening, so they would come up with a, you Radio either either they came up on voice or they came up with a shiny or something, you know, or yeah. a panel. 
So they, they when, when, he, when that jolly green was down hovering, uh, everybody was making their presence known. There was, we weren't that far apart, but we were, we were spread, spread out pretty good. Were you relieved to see everybody as you guys loaded that bird? Oh, hell yeah. Because you didn't, I mean, everybody probably thought everybody else was potentially gone. <laughs> yeah. I mean. Um, anyway, later on, well, uh, uh, say Mike Taylor, we renewed our friendship. He came into the CCN camp now and then, and I launched out of NKP a few times. And then over the years, we, we, we remained friends, and I, I just buried him in the punch bowl in Hawaii. Yeah. And the cancer got him. Yeah. You know, we were good friends. Uh, Jim Latham, the pilot, went on to fly F-4s, fast motors, and was shot down and captured. It was a prisoner for a while. In Vietnam? Yeah. And he was repatriated, and that first group of prisoners came back. Yeah. He, he came back, and he went on to, to fly with the Thunderbirds. Wow. And he wanted to retire as a one-star general. Wow. That's awesome. Hell of a nice guy. I'm still, still in contact with him. There, there was five total MACV SOG Halo infiltrations. What were the statistics of the other four that took place? I mean, it's not good. I know entire teams were lost. None of them, none of them was really a success in the sense of a recon mission. Yeah. Only one actually... The guys actually uh, were able to converge on, on, on each other, link up. Uh, one guy was lost, the Madison Strohline, who I, I had trained. Yeah, he's MIA? Yeah. Wow. Well, he's KIA body unrecoverable is how yeah. they carry yeah. yeah. Wow. What number jump were you guys out of the five? You guys were number one. I was the first guy out to ramp. Wow, and got credit for it. and we we uh, <clears throat> we SOG headquarters researched agency records, group records. We can find no no record anywhere of any combat planned combat Halo insertion. So we got credit for making the first one. That was the first one ever in the military. Then. Yeah. Because SOG was the first to do a Halo infill. That was the first one ever. So I, I imagine a lot of what you guys went through in successes and failures, was that information shared, follow on for the other SOG Halo infills? Uh, yeah, no. And I, that's, that's what I was starting to think of later on. I lost my train of thought. We, we, we set up a school there at a long time, a Halo school. And I taught there for a while, and I went back up to CCN. The Sergeant Major Rodriguez wanted me back up there for some reason. I said, I'm not going to run any more missions. I want you up here. So anyway, but <clears throat> one of our training jumps, uh, the crew came in, and it was the same crew that dropped us on the actual. So we got talking to them, and they were never debriefed. They never knew that we were off. Off the uh, ten kilometers, off the yeah, DZ. The click, you know. And what it was, it, 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 there's about a twenty mile area in this valley that the, uh, river bends and mountaintops look exactly alike. And they were taking back, you know, the, the Doppler radar were taking readings off of mountaintops and river bends. They should have been over here, and they were actually over here. <laughs> wow. Which is what I think happened. Incredible. Anyway, they finally, you know, finally shut it down. That's crazy. Was Billy Wall mad he wasn't on the first infill? Uh, he hurt himself. He was on a third. He He's actually on went third. in on the third. Wow. And Billy Wall, did you ever meet him? I haven't met him. I've heard about him, and obviously he's known in the community. Alan Shoemate just spread his ashes out over Rayford out there, and I, I went down and narrated the, the drop. Yeah. Billy Waugh operated on a philosophy of it was a world according to Billy Waugh. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. You know. Yeah. He got and he's a good guy. I mean, yeah. he, guys either liked him or hated him. Yeah. I, I liked him. I didn't have any issues with him. Yeah. But he was a strange dude. <clears throat> He, uh, because of his, his stature and, and, uh, and the books he wrote, and, and he, I, I think he operated on a philosophy that because Vietnam was a war zone, the whole country was a war zone. Yeah. And if you were skydiving and outside of Vung Tau, you're making a combat jump, you know? Yeah, yeah. And which we didn't go by that philosophy, but I think Billy Wild might have. Yeah. You, you, how do you get to a point to where you get injured? Is, do you, or do you do your SOG rotation and then you migrate into first group and then you get injured? Talk, let's talk through the, through the injury, the booby trap. Um, well, I, I was, um, one of the reasons, uh, Alan wanted us, me to do this is, uh, talk about the RT intruder. Mm-hmm. Bright light mission, which we can get into. Yeah, anyway. but after that, and that was in February of '71, um, I was done. I was not going on the ground after anymore. that operation. Yeah. Well, let's talk. Let's talk about it. We'll talk about it chronic- chronologically. Okay. Let's talk about that white light mission. So, for somebody who's watching this, who doesn't know what that means, what, what was that back then for you guys? Um. In, in early 71, the Army was going to run Lamson 719, which was the code name of the first incursion of U.S. forces into Laos. Mm. And, you know, and, the, and for some reason, in up in the i Corps area, they, they were, someone had to, they wanted to use three recon teams as blocking forces. Mm. Why not use the 101st Airborne Division? Yeah, 18 guys. Of, you know. You know. Anyway. <clears throat> so there were two, there, and I forget, one of them was RT Intruder. One was RT Python, my friend Jim Butler had. And the other one, I don't, I'm not sure who it was. Uh, I was managing a little recon club at CCN at the time, mm. thinking about packing my bags. And I was still trying to go straight to Okinawa, but they, they were going to send me back to Fort Devens to the 10th mm. group. But so I'm, I'm there at the CCN camp and RT intruder is one of these blocking teams. And it was a 12 man team, six and six. On it was my friend Sammy Hernandez. Guy you jump with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got pictures here. I'll show you. They're right on the ridge line border of Laos and, and, and uh, Vietnam in, in pretty high terrain. About uh, Hill 53 something. So this is about. 3,500, 4,000 foot elevation. And the, 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 there's a trail runs right down that border. <clears throat> Shooting. So the team is led by a guy named Doc Watson, who was a PhD candidate, there to write a, a thesis or something. And on it was another guy by the name of uh, Alan Lloyd, to call him Baby Jesus Lloyd. <laughs> And the reason they call them Baby Jesus is they were practicing uh, uh, stable extractions off the beach at uh, the CCN camp. And Alan was a little slender guy. And this helicopter picked him up on a stable rig and it was kind of dragging him over to water. And he was like running on top of the water. (laughs) And someone said, hey, that looks like Jesus walking (laughs) on the water, you know. Um. and Sammy Hernandez, uh, Wesley, a guy named Robinson, and somebody else. They're ambushed. Mm. <clears throat> and they, the, what, Doc was a cause for a, a extraction. And they come in with, uh, from the uh, aviation unit 
of the 101st called the Camacheros. And there's like one, two, like three liftoffs. And the last guy goes back to get the final team members who are Watson, Lloyd, and Sammy Hernandez. He picks them up. By that time, the whole world knows where they are. He picks them up. And this is very, very steep terrain. Mm -hmm. Turns and is shot down. He rolled over, pancakes in. The guys on strings are slung like they're on slingshots. Sammy's rope miraculously broke. And he falls back to the ground, dislocated his shoulder, and he's, he's rescued, actually. So Sammy's on the rope, and he just gets thrown off. His, his rope breaks. Just before the helicopter went in, Wow! his rope broke. And he fell to the ground. He fell back to the ground. And survived. And survived. He tells a story. Wow. Alan's got a video, if you can get him to show it to you. Sammy's interview says he was had movement all around him that night. He, says he was afraid to open his eyes because they mentioned the whites of his eyes. You know, They were that close. Wow. <clears throat> Sam and I became pretty good friends by that time. And uh, word came back that uh, Chopper's down, Sammy's missing in action, and, you know, KIAs, and et cetera, et cetera. And I feel terrible. So I grabbed my car 15, my web gear, and a bunch of magazines, and I go up to the TOC, the Tactical Operations Center's CCN there, which is like a beehive. Everybody's running around in circles and, you know, blah, blah, And there was a guy by the name of Danzer, who's a one zero with RT Habu, is going to go in on the bright light. <coughs> Daniel's a nice guy. He didn't have a lot of experience, but he's all right. And then a guy by the name of uh, Lucius Delk is the commander of, of Recon Company. They're running around. And so I go up and say, you know, need an extra hand? And, oh, yeah, we'd love to have you, Cliff. So I'm on the Bright Light mission. We, we, we insert... In, a, in a, the area, there's only one area that you could actually land a helicopter in in that particular area. That's where we go in. We move, and it's in Laos. The actual shoot down was actually in the Viet not Vietnamese side. So we move back across the border, maybe 50 meters, 75 meters. We find the site. Um, crew's gone. Um, Pilot, co-pilot, or burned. Is this the Jolly Green? Uh, no, 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 Huey. Oh, so it's American helicopter? Yeah, yeah. American crew? Yeah, from 101st. Wow. One, one door gunner is thrown out, and he's in a, a tree with the, besides broken bones from a big bullet hole right inside of his head. Hmm. You find the leg of the other door gunner under what's remained of the helicopter that didn't burn. Hmm. And uh, it's it's seeing burn people is not a pleasant sight. Yeah, especially Americans. Huh? Yeah. Anyway, so we uh, we we gather what we can, put them in body bags, whatever records we can find, flight manual, anything that's not burned beyond complete recognition, we put in a in a body bag. Weather comes in. So we decide to move to, to an RON site. A rest uh, overnight site. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, re remain overnight, rest overnight. On the way, we see the bodies of Doc Watson and Lloyd. Mm. Obviously deceased. Um, and they were on ladders? Or strings. On Strings, uh, uh, ropes. Yeah, ropes. With carabiners tied into the rope. Yeah, yeah, you got a couple of snap links. Yep. They, they drop us. It's, it's called a stable rig. And then yeah. You, you, know, like you, you, you make like a swift seat. Two snap links, they drop them. And uh, 
they're they're slapped up against the side of a very steep hill and, and they're obviously deceased. So we're gonna RON, go get them the next morning and, and get everybody out. <clears throat> so we moved to this RON site. I am at the top of the we set up a defense perimeter. I'm at the top and I had two claymores and I set my claymores out. And uh about seven o'clock in the morning, I, I hear a movement. And I mean, I'm looking up, and you can see the bushes moving with no wind. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Not a good sign. Yep. They started lobbing grenades into our, our position and opening up a small arms fire. We were lucky that because the terrain is such that they couldn't really flank us because it's it maybe just steep. Rocks, you know, you, you you couldn't get there to flank us, so it was pretty much line of sight. I uh, and, and again, like I say, we're on the side of a hill, pretty much. I fire my claymores, a couple of magazines, turn, and one of the guys on the team was named Jimmy Horton. Jimmy's been wounded. Is is uh. A grenade went off right next to him and pretty well severed his, his, his uh, lower leg. And I picked up him in, in one hand and was left of his leg in the other hand. And we actually fell over a, a about a 15, 20 foot cliff. Didn't know it was there. The rest of the team was down, set up another defensive position. <laughs> And Danzer, the team leader, had a Swedish K, which is a... A submachine gun, yeah. Yeah, a 9 millimeter. Not, it's not a jungle, you know, it's a drug, yeah. drugstore weapon, not a jungle <laughs> weapon. Yeah. You know. He's firing a Swedish K. And he had handset to his radio with a cord dangling and no rucksack and no radio. And one of the initial grenades took his rucksack right off, which had his radio in it. And he's in a state of shock. Um, well, he's concussed. I mean, this... He got blasted. Didn't he even got know blasted. Yeah. You know, about two, three inches either way, he'd have been dead. And these Tricom grenades are directional. Yeah. As opposed to omnidirectional like ours are. I mean, they, they explode in a direction. Yeah. Made for booby traps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's trying to talk, trying to shoot, and there, we did have Covey overhead. We had a Covey aircraft overhead. And I got out my survival radio and came up on voice and started working things <laughs> and took over the team and uh, worked Cobras right on top of us, brought in VNAF, A1Es, Vietnamese, uh, uh, A1E is a World War II uh, slow mover. Yeah. Drop bombs. They had F4s working the ridge line. And they estimated a company size NVA unit was, was up there. On top of you. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we, well, we're not doing too bad. Didn't lose anybody. Five, we, we, we brought in a Huey to get Horton out because he's most severely wounded. I sent one of the mountain yards down to get the rope to bring it back up where we could hook Horton up. And as he's climbing back up, he hooks himself onto the thing so he can actually, you know, and about that time, a, a, a RPG with a variable round goes off right next to the helicopter, wounds the pilot, wounds the gunner, co-pilot, or wounds the co-pilot, or first officer, whatever. He turns and gets out of there. Just And that mountain yard on the road went, phew, just yanked him right out of the jungle, you know. His eyes, like I remember his eyes, but that big. So around. he's hooked in because he's trying to stabilize the rope to get up to the casualty, <laughs> and then they take an RPG and the vectors off, and then he gets snatched out of the snatches jungle. Snatches him right out of the jungle. Oh my god! 
Did he let, did he survive? Yeah. <laughs> yep. So anyway, we shoot it out for a while. And they finally bring in a, a, an HH-53, a Jolly Green, that, that turned out to be a SAR, an Air Force SAR bird, Sea Air Rescue. You know, they're not designed really for jungle stuff, but he was there. And they have twin miniguns mounted. Oof. I mean, you got to visualize, there's a hill. This guy just flies. He's like hovering right here, <laughs> about 30 feet. Above us, but is you know park is facing the hill, and those mini guns F4s are working the ridge line. So just raining brass on you guys. Oh yeah, and uh, get the team, and it's a jungle penetrator on a winch. Yep, comes down. And it's got a metal thing that can break through trees. It's and you sit through. on it. You get you yeah, yeah, bring you it down. And you sit on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it'll hold three people. I kept Danzer, I kept Jim Woodham, the the, uh, the medic. Always good to have a medic with you, you know, if you're yeah. in a gunfight, uh, and myself. And as we were lifting up, the weight causes the winch to give way, and the thing flops back down to the ground, and I get off. Did it snap it? No. It just gave way. It gave way. Yeah. And the thing comes back down to the ground, and I unhooked, got off, and got them out and I'm on the ground by myself for not long, but uh, then he lowered it again and got me and I got out. So when do they, <laughs> when do they navigate that Sammy's alive? When do they navigate that Sammy's alive? I don't know. Sam was a lot. He hurt his shoulder. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he's still on the ground. No, no, no. He's gone. He's gone. Okay. He got out. He got out to Dave. The, the day before, actually. Oh, the day that it crashed? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you guys came in for the recovery post yeah. that. Right, right. Wow. Did you guys have to leave all the casualties behind? We did. Wow. They're still there. Really? I've been back three times trying to find them. So the POW MIA detachment never recovered them? Uh, no. What happened? One, again, a train as such. There's only one place to land in that entire area. Yeah. So you can't put a heavy unit in there. Um, Sagar's not going to put anybody in. The crew were from the 101st, which is their their call, you know. There's, yeah. And why they didn't try it, I, I can't answer. I think about that every day, too. Yeah. But they didn't. Yeah. Uh, I was contacted in the late 90s. Actually, by the brother of the door gunner whose leg we found. Wow. And he, for his family, wanted to know where X marked the spot. Wow. They knew he was gone. They didn't have any, yeah. you know, they just wanted to know where X marked the spot where their kin had perished, you know, which I can understand. <clears throat> then I got involved with the JCRC then. <coughs> Excuse me. And in, uh, uh, 2003, I went back with a, from the then the JTFFA, Joint Task Force Full Accounting, to try and find him. And it was a poorly run mission. Uh, this is way on the hot top of a hill, and we couldn't get up there. Uh, the Vietnamese counterparts were supposed to have cut an LZ, and they didn't do it. So we... Got a trip to Vietnam, which was interesting. <laughs> yeah. I went back again in 2015 with the same unit with a different designator. <clears throat> and the Vietnamese team leader had an entirely different mission, an entirely different plan going, and we didn't know about it. So we didn't get in then. I went back in 2018, and we actually found by GPS within six click within six meters of the uh, uh, where the helicopter site was. Did you find any parts or anything? No. Just nothing. We did find well we didn't find anything, but we, we, we ascertained that we did find the area. I yeah. got pictures of it. Do you remember did it bring back memories 
when you guys were on that target of like, did you see any familiar like terrain? Yesterday. Really? One of the one of the things I remember from the actual mission when we were at the site picking up what we could pick up was there was like a little like like a break in the, in, the, in the trees where you could actually see out of the, the vegetation, and I remember seeing the the Ashall Valley down there and, and where the old Ashall airstrip was. That that's still there, and I saw that same site in 2018 when I was back. That's incredible. Now, the, 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 the intel guy on, 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 on that unit is a guy named Ray Kern. He's a retired warrant officer and best intel guy I've ever seen. Odd little dude, but he's an um, interesting all guy. Right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> all the intel guys are. <laughs> We're some medics, man. <laughs> no, I mean, you weren't a medic. No, right? no, I was a Bravo. I was a dumb, the dumb guy. <laughs> anyway, they found a cliff. The pretty sure is the cliff that we fell off that we had our gu- our gunfight at. Wow! And he found a lot of uh, seven six two shell casings. Wow! Which had have been from the miniguns. Yeah. They found an unexploded claymore. That was probably yours. Wasn't mine. I fired mine. Oh, you fired yours? <laughs> Hell no! <laughs> that I think had have been on, in the backpacks of either Watson. Or Lloyd, because they never had a, had a chance of, you know. And the NVA didn't have claymores that I knew of. Yeah. And they, they'd have probably fired them if they had a. They found some uh, rusted snap links. Yeah. And, you know, the, the rigging, the uh, turnbuckle, you rig a Huey. Yeah. That repelled or jumped from. Yeah. They found a rusted out turnbuckle. Wow. Crazy. So they're naive. They're, they're they're pretty sure that they found the site. You know, and what what they do. I mean, these are dedicated people. I've uh, you know, I give them all the respect. But there's nothing there now. There's nothing left. The jungle ate it up. Jungle ate up. Any human remains. Any solid solid objects were picked up by natives. Uh, and the soil in that part of the world is very acidic. Yeah. You know. It chews up everything. And while we were there, this last time, the wind was blowing like hell. It was raining. And you could see the, the trees, the roots actually moving. You know? Yeah. Is this like the tipping point for you? Do you, after this situation and all the things that are involved, are you like, it's it's time. It's time to move on. Yeah, that, that was my, that was my coup de gras, if you will. I mean, I, <laughs> I've been. I was on another operation to, to go back a little bit that was, came pretty close. I, I thought I was going to not make it twice in my life. Mm. That was one of them, uh, but here I am. So here, yeah. there, by the grace of God, you know. Um, but I, I wanted to go to Oki. Mm. They sent me to the tenth group, and I was. Uh, one, I ran a parachute club, and I ran a demonstration team. They, we had red, white, and blue jumpsuits, and we were pretty. I mean, we did demos <laughs> over New England, and, <laughs> and we looked good. Yeah. Had Mark II PCs, still round parachutes. Wow. Um, and I, I was an AST NCO. Mm. Um, I'd made 87 as I was leaving Vietnam. And I, I made a, uh, I was an AST NCO, and it was, it was very interesting. I learned a lot. AST? Air Specialist Team. Air Specialist Team. Okay. Uh, it, it's different today. I, I When I first moved down to Fayetteville, I, not knowing how the, the structure was, I was going to try and you know, go to work for the Army as an AST. Hmm. Each company had an Air Specialist Team in the Group S3. Hmm. Senior NCO and an officer. I was C Company's AST NCO. What I did, if they had a jump, I coordinated the drop zone. Mm. If they had range firing, I coordinated the uh, ammo. Yeah. And if they had uh, wanted to train up in the White Mountains, I coordinate the everything to get them up there. And got it. You know, I think it's ops detachment now. That's what they call it. They call it SSD. 
which is like all the training segments of the, yeah. of, the of the group. But anyway, I finally got orders for Okinawa for first group. As I mentioned earlier, I and there was a guy named Ben Dennis, who was a good friend of mine and was in the Halo business forever. And, um, he had the Intel slot on the Halo team, so it was full. I said, "Hey, I'm, hey you put me where you want me." Yeah. And I was assigned to A222, you know, as the intel sergeant. And I was happy. I said, mm. you know, I, I felt I finally achieved what all SF NCOs want to achieve, and that is be on an A detachment. Mm. I'm on an A team. And mm. I was really pr kind of proud of myself. <laughs> went to school to school, went to the Philippines in a DART mission. I must have given a 500 inoculations for cholera and typhoid. Wow. You know, the, the Pampanga province has a typhoon every year and the Pampanga River overflows every year. Mm -hmm. Wipes out all the local villages. And We went in with an augmented, <clears throat> an augmented medics and, I, and, and split the team. And I, and I led, even though I was the youngest ranking, I was the youngest E7, I still led one of the split teams. And um, we, and I was a scuba guy, so I ran the R, We had RB fifteen, and we had our you know our our gun inoculation guns, you know. Mm -hmm. And we'd go into a village, line the people up, and start shooting them up with collar and typhoid, and bringing bringing food resupplies in. And in the army, in their infinite wisdom, again. Came up with some stuff called Nutra Buns. Hmm. That looked they're round loaves of bread, just fortified with all high nutrients and everything. And <laughs> a couple things, these people want rice. Yeah, that's what they've eaten all their life. Yeah, they don't, they don't want any bread. Two, they bring in on helicopters and slings and blow the roofs off their hooches. The huts, the, I mean, these people are very rural people. You know, yeah. they live in fast roof hut villages. These little cops are blowing the roofs off. I said, Jesus Christ, what, who dreams this shit up, you know? Yeah. How do you... <laughs> anyway, we uh, did that for about 30 days in the Philippines. Ran a jump master course. And then we went, came... My team and other team were, went TDY back to Vietnam and the FANC projects. Hmm. Forces Army, the Republic of Khmer. We're training Cambodians. Oh, okay. Was this a classified program at the time? Nah. Okay. Well, it, 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 it may have been confidential Sensitive or maybe or something. Secret, yeah. but it wasn't, wasn't TS. Yeah. Um, and we had a group of like 100 Cambodians and we're putting them through a... a there, there were some... Per, Professional people, some school teachers, some um, college educated uh, Cambodians, and they were going to form the cadre of an elite unit in the Cambodian Army, mm. which there is no more. Mm. And I was out uh, one day, I was out setting up a land nav course, and, and this, this is an area called Long High. And Long High is on the Vung Tau Highway. Beautiful little coastal town with a lot of small French villas lighting the road and then the beach. And there's a, the camp, the New Yokoto Mountains, open area, and South China Sea. And we're putting these guys through like a like a, a ranger course, if you will, without mm -hmm. the, a lot of the physical stuff because they just don't understand that in their in their heritage. But we were running them and, and some weapons firing. We were armed with the 38s. We, we, we didn't have any uh, heavy duty weapons. It was all supposedly secure, all dry areas. And this is in 72. This is late 72. Hmm. The main war is over for all intent and purpose. It got dragged out to 75, right? The final, yeah, yeah. They, the final pullout was 75. Took that long for all the ambassadors and political nabobs to 
collect all their spoils, I guess. Anyway, so I'm out one day setting up a land nav course, running a land nav course. About two days later, I'm out in the same area supervising a patrol. We were, you know, I, uh, had a, a group of Cambodians. We were teaching how to run a patrol, you know, how to do IA drills and so on and so forth and, you know, the basics of going on a patrol. And bam, I stepped in this damn thing and just pitched me forward and shattered my foot. And I remember looking down, and I still had a big toe sticking off, but the rest of my foot was gone. Wow. Was that pressure plate uh, just a mine? Homemade job, pressure release. Yeah, and just blew your foot off. Blew your leg off. Oh, it shattered my leg. No, it shattered my foot. Yeah. Um, so you're doing a training mission. Yep. And then you do 12 rotations or 12 missions in Magby Sog and don't have a scratch. And you <laughs> you go back to Vietnam with a training mission and lose your whole leg. Well, I've been back then to the third field hospital in Saigon. <clears throat> Excuse me. There they took the front part of my foot off. Hmm. So I still had an ankle and a heel, but no toes. Wow. Um, they wanted to medevac me back to the States. I talked them into sending me back to the Army Hospital in Camp Cooley in Okinawa, which they did. By that time, osteomyelitis had set in and my foot was all affected. And... Uh, you could tell you got that because it smells, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it smells terrible. Anyway, on Oki, they did the actual amputation of my whole foot hmm. and uh, probably saved my life because they, they stemmed this spread of this osteomyelitis. <clears throat> and I was medevac back to the States. I was up in Letterman Army Hospital in San Francisco. Not knowing what you know, not not, not knowing what was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, and as I said briefly earlier, I, at a time when I could have used some counseling, both psychologically and physically, uh, we didn't get it. Mm. I was unceremoniously given a pat in the back and opened the door to Letterman Army Hospital and sent on my way. Did you medically retire from the military from yeah. that point on? Did you ever get disability from oh, yeah. VA? I'm 100% disabled. Okay. but uh, Well, I got, I mean, that that was part I, of I had 40% from my, my my leg. Yeah. I can't hear. I got 30%. I got rheumatoid yeah. arthritis. I got prostate cancer. The fact that you have a missing leg from combat and that doesn't equate to 100% disability is alarming, but... I mean, it's well. I didn't complain because I was still otherwise fairly physically fit. In fact, I kept jumping. You know, I, I must have a thousand jumps with a prosthesis. Yeah, <laughs> but back then, you guys didn't have any protocol. I mean, veteran advocacy now, post global war on terror, is a massive undertaking. Nonprofits, yeah. organizations, government uh, oversight, all these things. But your peer group especially coming out of SOG. I mean, all combat um, veterans from Vietnam didn't get any care in mental health. Yeah, I've got some attaboys, you know. Yeah. But uh, did you have a lot of peers that were in SOG that were dealing with these kind of issues mental health-wise? Or was your group specifically more resilient, you think, than the normal? You know, I, that's a good question. I, I found that, um, well, I, I, I'm a, a plank holder of the Special Operations Association. Um, <clears throat> we, 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 <laughs> I don't want to sound overly egotistical here, but we, we weren't your average GI, if you will. Most of the guys that ran recon were professional soldiers. You know, they weren't fresh from their mom's apron strings when they went to Vietnam, as a lot of young Marines were, or a lot of young infantry guys were. Most of them had prior service, so they knew what they were into, you know. Mm. 
some guys, some guys uh, took it with a grain of salt, and some didn't. Mm. When I went back in, in 2015, uh, there were two other guys that went with me that weren't weren't in SF. Uh, one was at uh, LZ. One one of the major battles for the 101st. Nice guy, sharp guy. Other was a helicopter pilot who became a farmer in North Carolina, and he was he was in Ashaw and was flying a Huey <coughs> with a I guess it's called a stick or a, a, a flight you know five or six helicopters pulling out. And then he saw the one in front of him get shot down. And he turned around and he saw the one in back of him get shot down. And this guy was rattled. I mean, he was a poster child for PTSD. Wow. And, uh, I mean. Even in, I mean, how. Oh, this, this is a 2015. So this guy's obviously post this entire experience. It's still affecting him. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, I've seen some guys, not so much SF guys. But, you know, you spend a little time and a lot of things still bother me, you know. Unfortunately, my wife uh, is a Gold Star sister, and uh, I, I, I knew her brother in Vietnam who was killed there on a recon mission. And that's how we got connected. So she has enough knowledge, my background, to give me a little slack whenever I might need it. That's awesome. So you had a support network from somebody yeah. who experienced similar losses. Yeah, and I losses. met some good good civilian friends. And two, I uh, for a while I when I retired, and I was a bachelor in L.A. and I hit the mean streets of L.A. pretty hard, you know. Uh, but I think I'm fairly sane for some of the stuff I've been involved in. Yeah, I mean, a lot of you guys are talking to Pat and to Dick Watson and John. A lot of you guys seemingly had a lot of resilience before even going into SAW. You, whether it was upbringing or things that you kind of a, attributed and experienced through the military before getting to, to SAW, but it's almost like you guys were prepared to go into that with some level of resilience and expectations. Yeah, I, I, I don't know why or how. I was an only child. I don't have any sibling. And my parents were a little older when I, when I came along. So I, I, I used to do a lot of things by myself. And I was good at being by myself. Yeah. That helped me. And my mother was a loving mother, caring person, but she was a troubled person. Mm. She would have argued with the devil if she could. And I inherited a lot of tenacity from her. <laughs> yeah. I found out later on, you know. Mm. That, that, but anyway. Well, we're proud of you guys. I mean, after a t long career in special operations, when I talk to you guys, it just puts everything in perspective because, I mean, there are battles significant in history in the GWAT but nothing that compares to the level of complexity that you had to deal with, which, which is seemingly simple, but without the resources, without the, I mean, doing a, the first MACV SOG halo jump with no O2 in the dark with no nods. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine the approval process now for something like that, but it probably be kinked before it even briefed. You know, I, I spoke to, I, I, I've been guest speaker down at Yuma twice. Yeah. At the halo school. And I spoke, uh, did you ever run across a Marine colonel by the name of Odell, Digger Odell? Yeah, yeah, I know Odell. He became a pretty good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Walt Shoemate introduced me to him. Yep. We became skydiving friends, actually. We made a lot of jumps out of, out of Paris. He got me to talk to uh, First Force Recon Company at uh, Camp Pendleton. And I did. <clears throat> and I, I remember... I, I kind of like to tell the story. These are sharp guys. I I have most respect for these guys. They they work work their asses off with, with very little support sometimes. Anyway, 
So I talked some of the war stories. You know, I talked a little about, about running recon and our halo jump. And when I asked her questions, the the biggest question, not question necessarily, but comment they had was, we don't believe you did that with round parachutes. <laughs> Crazy. You know? <laughs> yeah. Crazy. How much forward drive did that thing have? How many knots? None. You just fall flat straight. <laughs> pretty much. Well, we like I said, we had seven gore TUs. I mean, they, yeah. you could turn them at pretty good. You couldn't really do a, you know, get many Gs out of a 360, but, uh, you know, you, you, you could steer them. Later on, of course, we had PCs, and they had 10, 12 knots forward yeah, speed. Yeah, forward speed. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, my, my best time was running a free fall halo detachment in SF in 10th group, and I had a SIF company or a SIF, uh, SIF team, recce sniper team. But, man, we just never got the opportunity to do a halo infill. And then I imagine you had that mustard stain up on your – Halo wings, but you didn't have halo wings at the time, did you? No. <laughs> you got to go back. Did they have to go back and do some doctrinal thing to like send you to school or get you qualified and then put mustard stain on, or they they just didn't do it? No, nah, we were good. I, I I we never got. You know CK? Yeah, CK. Yeah, yeah. I know CK from the unit. Yeah, yeah. I met him years ago. We for about five or six years we had. Uh, and Billy Wall got involved in a couple of them. We had a, a combat halo jump reunions down at, at Rayford. Yeah. I met CK there. We got talking. And this is before he got, we got wounded again. Um, got, and he made a combat insert. Yeah. And we got comparing notes, you know, barring classification and such. But uh, a lot, a lot of similar things that mm. uh, you know. I remember he said he tandem, tandem in team gear. Mm. I'm thinking, what if you get split up? You know, you got team gear. You know, he said we don't get split up. We got GPS. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. I remember one of them. They had to see when dirty sparkled the drop zone, so the entire drop zone was illuminated. And then under nods, it's like landing in daylight. I mean, it's with all the technology now. I mean, you got C-130 covering you in the air. Yeah. And then killing everything on the ground. Yeah. A lot different than jumping blindly into Vietnam. Well, man, I appreciate you, sir. This has been an amazing conversation with you. Um, I'll give you final words. If you got any final words or final thoughts. Well, I'll tell you, I, I would like to – I'll tell you one more little war story. Yeah. If I may. Yes. There's a reason. You got, you got the – Okay, yeah, we no, got time. It won't take two yeah. minutes. That still bears some bears on my mind. <clears throat> um, my my one one was a guy named Roger Teeter, mm. who after I left and got involved with the Halo program, he got he ran a team. Then he got flying Covey, and when he was flying Covey, they flew into a cloud bank one day and never came out. Wow. Yeah. Anyway. We had a uh, area of recon mission, and we went into this area. It, I remember it because it was like a pristine forest, mm. more more so than a jungle. You know, it was yeah. like a well, that's your too bad we don't have a picnic basket. You know, <laughs> so we stopped to rest and hear voices. And there's a little stream down here, and there's r- kind of rolling hills. And we're here, here from maybe here to the outer office over there. And here comes a bunch of people walking up this trail, you know, carrying stuff and some soldiers and some civilians, obviously. <laughs> so I get thinking, well, let's get out of here. We'll come back and get a prisoner. Mm. Good plan. So I call for and they come, you know, with my Powers to be, say, that's great. Well, they come uh, pick us up, we go back to the launch site and replan things and wait a few days and go back into the same area, different LZ, but same area. We're moving to the 
through this pristine forest to a more of a jungle environment to go on this trail we found, and we came up behind an ambush that was set up for us. Because they thought you were going to be on the same place. Looks that way. Wow. Okay. So I always ran second. And uh, I always carried my own radio. A lot of guys had a radio guy. I figured your lifeline's a radio. If you need it, I want it now. Yeah. So I always carried my own radio. I always ran second so I could see what was going on. The guy behind me was always it was an M79 guy. Roger ran behind him, and my tail gunner ran last. Anyway, these guys are turning around when we come out of the jungle, you know, and we do our IA, our IA drill and drop a bunch of them. And, uh, move That's immediate ba- action drill. Yeah, so immediate yeah. action drill. Yeah. Move back to a, a, a tree line, and this early on, we had King Bees, H-34s flown by Vietnamese, were our launch aircraft. No, 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 I, I'm sorry. I'm, let me back up. I, I got way ahead of myself. As we're moving, as we're moving through this uh, uh, pristine j- jungle area, I hear a baby crying. And people going, shh, shh, you know, trying to shut this baby up. I go, Wow. You know, what do we have up there? So let's get a little bit closer and see what we got. I think we got maybe a major base camp of some kind. So moving toward that, and it was a hill, hilly area, moving toward that sound, we walked up behind this ambush. So we, we, we shut up the ambush, and then we got out. We got extracted, called in airstrikes, and found a major, we, got a, we found a major re- base camp. Wow. Just leveled it. Wow. I mean, leveled it. And I wonder what ever would have became of that baby. You think about that baby? Yeah. Yeah. Had I not ruined his day. <laughs> I know, because that baby is the, what alerted you to that. <laughs> if it wasn't for the baby, would you not have discovered the ambush, potentially? Uh, don't know. It's a good question. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd have kept moving that far or not. I, I, I probably would not have because it was, it was going from one type terrain to another. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I would probably set up an ambush along the trail where I could, had, I could get out a lot easier, you know, yeah. especially if you have a prisoner. You want, you want to be able to call in, I'll call in, you know, help get out of there. Yeah. So probably not, Crazy. but that's just, you know, a little point of things that you remember. It's crazy. It's just the small things. <laughs> I mean, if it wasn't for that baby, you might even be alive. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're alive. Anyway. I'm glad you're here. Cliff, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, do you do any social media or any of that stuff? Do you do social media or? I'm on Facebook, but I'm not a big computer yeah. guy. Yeah. What's the best SOG book? If somebody's looking to look into the history, the stories, the best accuracy, what do you think is the best book ever well, written? Plasters is uh, probably the best, most accurate. There, there's a lot. Uh, well, Nick Brockhausen didn't do half bad job. Yeah. Uh, you know, Tilt Meyer, he wrote his books and... Uh, now, I like Tilt. He's a friend, been a friend for a long time. Um, Dave uh, Maurer wrote a pretty good one called The Killing Killing Place. Yeah. It's not half bad. I don't read a lot about Vietnam. Mm. You know, people told me I ought to write something, but I, I'm... You're good. I, I can say what I want in two sentences, you know, where you need a peer... Uh, the chapter is just, you no. know. We just spent an hour and a half talking about it. We didn't even scratch the surface. Yeah. You had a lot to say. There's a lot of experiences yeah. there. Cliff, I appreciate you, man. Yeah. Thank you for coming on the podcast, sir.